Hello, and welcome to Western Civ. In this bonus episode, I sit down with Professor Plahi of Harvard University to talk about his most recent book, The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine. The book covers the history of Ukraine from literally the beginning of mankind up until the present day. I have recorded a bonus supplemental, talks about the book in brief, but let it be known it's a fantastic work. It covers the history of the region from beginning to end, really without becoming plodding or becoming too superficial at any point in time. Now, in this interview, what you'll notice immediately is that I recorded the questions separately than I recorded my conversation with Professor Plahi, and that is just to maintain as much of the audio quality as I could, because any telephone interview is always going to be a little bit weaker in quality. And you notice that in the beginning, especially the internet issues do resolve themselves as we get going, but um, just wanted you to know that going in. So I start with my first question for Professor Plahi, which is about the Ukraine has gained so much prominence in, in the modern world very recently. How has it done so? How has the Ukraine for such a small nation, becomes so important in world politics? Well, there is a lot of talk uh, out there about the start of the Cold War, the return of the old Cold War. And uh, to a degree that this, this uh, parallels are um, correct, or maybe uh, to a degree that they are um, legitimate. Uh, Ukraine is a new battleground of sorts. And it's a new battleground uh, between the Russia that is now back as a major, certainly, military power in the region and the uh, Western Allies uh, uh, Alliance, which has had good and bad times in the last 30 plus years. But it looks like that the uh, West in general uh, is united around this idea that uh, the annexation of uh, the territory of other states, it's, it's the wrong way to, to go. This is something that nations like Ukraine have the right to choose in terms of the designing of their political system or their overall orientation. So uh, that is that is probably the main reason of why why uh, Ukraine is in the news in the last probably five to six years. And there are different layers to that to, to that particular story. Uh, it is about geopolitics. It's, it's also about democracy and, and democratic development. Um, it is about uh, energy and, and economic development of the region. So there are a, a number of angles through which you uh, can approach this new developments in Eastern Europe, in East Central Europe, and Ukraine will be at the center. Which brings also Ukrainian history closer to the center and the question of their whether the history can, first of all, what, what is that country that didn't exist on the map before 1991? Where did it come from? And what, what role history plays in all these developments? Next, I asked Professor Plahi, how has the most recent chapter that he added in this new edition of the book on contemporary Ukrainian history, what does that add to our understanding of how the Ukraine fits into the geopolitical system today? Uh, the first edition of the book was published in 2014, so exactly at the time when uh, things uh, started 
uh, to develop quite in, in a dramatic fashion in Ukraine and in the region as a whole. So in 2013, we have this, uh, the Maidan contest in Ukraine, uh, and uh, by 2014, you see the annexation of the Crimea by the Russian Federation, the start of the undeclared war in Eastern Ukraine, and uh, the book uh, covers uh, covers uh, the, the original, uh, the, the first edition of the book covers the developments up to 20, 15 really, 2014 maybe. So back then I was making a lot of guesses because I was writing as things were developing and uh, this new edition allowed me to look back at, at what was happening in 2014, 2015 and check some of my assumptions. I'm very happy that I didn't have to rewrite uh, much or actually almost nothing, maybe some some minor corrections. But the, uh, the, the uh, question question then was what happened in Ukraine after 2014 and after 2015. And this is this is a question from uh, many developments, but including very important developments here in the United States. Uh, the the uh, first the first impeachment of President Trump, which of course got got a lot of attention. Second impeachment was uh, kind of went almost unnoticed, but the first got a lot of a lot of ear time. Uh, a lot of strange names popped up at the, the, the very top of the of the news feed in the United States of America, and the question was, okay, what that story was about. So um, I looked at the last uh, um, five, six years in uh, history of Ukraine, trying to figure out where exactly did the ongoing war with Russia put the country in terms of its internal development, economic reform, political reform within the country, but also the international standing of the country and the, the U.S.-American, U.S.-Ukrainian relations. Uh, part of them was, of course, the, the, the story that led to the impeachment of President Trump are part of this, this new, new chapter, the late, this chapter that I added to the book. Now we get into a little bit of the history. I wanted to talk to Professor Plahi about Kiev and about how Kiev as a city becomes crucial to the development of Ukraine. Really, in this next portion of the interview, what I wanted to get into is the way in which the rulers of the Rus Kiev and Kiev itself becomes part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And how that decision to become Eastern Orthodox really starts to get into how Kiev develops and then ultimately how Ukraine develops as part of East and West as the story goes forward. Here's what he had to say. Well, uh, one of the uh, issues that are being decided today uh, in Ukraine, uh, including in the course of this ongoing war, is about the uh, identity of Ukraine and Ukrainians and uh, religion and religious tradition, which is also cultural tradition, is an important part of that identity. Uh, the uh, Ukraine is a country that is really on the watershed between Eastern and Western Christianity. And uh, uh, on the one hand, it belongs to the, to the Orthodox, Orthodox Christian world, together with Greece and with Romania and Bulgaria and, and Russia. Uh, on the other hand, part of Ukraine created the church that was, uh, that uh, really is a hybrid church that combines elements of Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity. So Kiev, from that point of view, is positioned right there on, on, on this line. And again, Ukraine is a battleground from that point of view as well. So what happened back 
more than one millennium ago, first of all, put Ukraine into a particular, in a particular space, cultural space, religious space. But it also contributed to the fact that Ukraine today is a battleground. When uh, the Russian nationalists go to fight in Ukraine, the slogan is that we are actually protecting the orthodox values. <laughs> and and uh, again, the, the, the question is what orthodox values and how different are they from Christian values and, and so on and so forth. So all of this, all of these issues are being decided in, in Ukraine today. And again, the, the, the link between history and, and contemporary developments could, couldn't be more clear and probably more stronger than in the case of religion. Next, I asked Professor Plahi specifically about Kiev in terms of whether or not Kiev was founded by the Vikings, because the Vikings are obviously a major story point in the development of Ukraine, as well as the development of a lot of Eastern and Baltic states. I think the Vikings in general tend to be a little bit misunderstood, and he does a nice job of getting into that and then also establishing the trade relationship between uh, maybe Viking Kiev and also Rus Kiev and how that relates to Constantinople and the greater Mediterranean world. Well, uh, it, the Kiev was not founded by the Vikings as a, as a town, as an outpost. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, it existed uh, before the Viking Age. So it was created uh, by the local tribesmen and then also used by another rulers of the region, Hazars, who were um, really, um, their, their um, power base was uh, in the uh, steppe area near, near uh, Volga River. So, but what happened with the uh, arrival of the Vikings was that Kiev became a, a capital of independent state. So that is that is really a, a contribution of the Vikings and why Kiev was chosen as the capital and the main seat of the Vikings was its geographical position. It is on the Dnieper River, and of course the rivers were the main the main. Uh, trade routes and, and communication lines uh, in, in, in the past. So uh, it was a trade route that was bringing people from uh, what is today Eastern Europe to the, to the Black Sea and to Constantinople, to Byzantium. So Byzantium was really the center of the world. Constantinople was the center of the world. If you have anything to sell, that was the place where you could get the best the best price. And that, 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 that is what Vikings were trying to do. And they were collecting all sorts of um, goods that they were then bringing to, to um, Byzantium. They were collecting them from the tribes in the wooded areas in Eastern Europe. And we're bringing to Kiev because Kiev was positioned exactly on the border between the forest areas and the steppe areas. The steppe areas were controlled by the nomads. It was a big challenge for the Vikings how to get their merchandise and then go through the through the steppe areas that were controlled by the nomads and eventually bring it to, to Byzantium. So Kiev was the last safe place where the Vikings who were the products of this wooded areas felt themselves secure. They would collect all their merchandise in Kiev, put it on the ships, and then would go down on, on the Dnieper River all the way to the Black Sea and then all the way to Constantinople. So in that way, Kiev became really the center of this Viking land, of this Viking state that was created in Eastern Europe. So Vikings didn't uh, uh, didn't found or didn't build a uh, uh, cave, but they certainly turned it into, into the capital of the state that they built. Now we get into one of my favorite parts of the interview. We're going to talk about the Cossacks. Because for myself, I know the Cossacks as a military unit in Sid Meier's civilization. But in reality, the Cossacks 
are more than maybe just the light cavalry that we know them to be. If you read the book, you'll understand what a Cossack is much more than I had any sense of going in. But in this next question, I wanted to get in with Professor Plahi about what's a Cossack? How do we define a Cossack? And how do the Cossacks contribute to the development of Ukraine overall? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do that. Uh, well, uh, the Cossack is the, the term itself is of Turkic origins, and it has a number of different meanings from the uh, pre-booter to a um, heroic fighter. So you, you can choose on, on, the, on that spectrum. And uh, the uh, Turkic origins of the term suggest to us that also the first Cossacks were of Turkic background. So those were people who uh, really went into the step, into the like American prairies would be probably the, the best comparison, who lived outside of their, of their tribes or of their states and were involved in all sorts of things like trapping and, and, and fishing and also uh, occasional robbery. So they lived out of whatever whatever they could get in that in those step areas and as i already mentioned step areas were also the areas that were crisscrossed by trade routes so they, they, they were also trying to to benefit from those trade routes as well now uh, the uh, by the 14th and 15th century the situation changes in terms of who are the cossacks the term is really adopted or applied to people who are now not nomads themselves, who come from the north, from the wooded areas, and they come in the search of the same things that the, the Turkic Cossacks were interested in. It's fisher, uh, fishing, it's, it's hunting, it's, it's, uh, it's also um, trying to control the trade routes. But there is also one more thing that those people from the north, from the settled areas, want in the steppes that the original causes didn't want. They want land, arable land, right? So the, 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 and what you see is again the story that is very, very maybe familiar to the to the uh, um, Americans looking at the history of the prairies, looking at the history of the American Mexican border. So that would be roughly the, the area of the what is today southern Ukraine. But broader than that, it's area from the Danube all the way to the Amur. So you look the you look at the, the the southern southern belt of what is today Russia and Ukraine. That's the steppe areas where by 14th, 15th, 16th century, the settled population started to move into the area. Again, in, in the West, it is also sometimes uh, called settled colonialism or settlers colonialism. And the, the Cossacks are the guys who are, who are in the far front. So they, 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 they are in, engaged in these conflicts and wars with the nomads because they are pushing nomads out of their lands, out of their territories. Uh, they're also involved in, the, in this production and grain. Ukraine becomes known for, for, for grain. Now, uh, it's not easy to move into the into the, um, the steppe areas and try to reclaim and take something away from the nomads, given that the, the nomads actually are the groups that used to control that area. It's not like in the Western story of, of, of moving into the, into the prairies, or American story of moving into the prairies, that somehow the, 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 the settled population has advanced military technology or military techniques. Nothing like that. In that area, there are two equals in terms of the, of the capacity of fighting wars. And again, one of those groups were dominant before that, like Mongols, right? So it's it's a much more much more again fight of the equals and Cossacks are part of that of that story. Now Cossacks are also trying to stop the the slave trade that is going on in the region because the nomads one of the ways of of uh, uh, them making their living 
they're capturing in this war expeditions, they're capturing uh, people whom they turn into slavery and then sell on the slave markets in Mediterranean, in, in the Ottoman Empire. So th th there is also this, this um, part of Cossack mythology is based on this story of them liberating the captives, liberating the slaves. Now, uh, Cossacks is not just a Ukrainian phenomenon. You look at the entire these steppe areas and you have Amur Cossacks, the Russian Cossacks, you have Don Cossacks, you have Volga Cossacks, and you have also Dnieper Cossacks, which are the Ukrainian Cossacks. What makes the Ukrainian Cossacks unique is that they were able in the 17th century to create a state of their own, right? So it's like, think about the pirates. They're like pirates of the steppes. Have you heard about pirates creating a state of their own and running it? No. And this is true for the Amur Cossacks. This is true for Don Cossacks. But the Ukrainian Cossacks created a state of their own. They rebelled in the 17th century, and they created a Cossack state that existed in the 17th and 18th century, which created then the, the elite on its own, that created culture on its own, and uh, is considered by Ukrainian historians the early modern foundations of the contemporary Ukrainian state. So but again, if you try to look into the past and look at the Ukrainian history where the area was run not from outside power, but by some power within the region. You will start with the Vikings and you will start with the cave in Rus and the state created around Kiev. And then you would continue in the 17th and 18th century with the Cossack state. So the Cossacks are another group that uh, turned the, 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 the region into its, the center of the new polity and was trying to somehow deal with the step and with the nomads there, either in terms of trade or in terms of conflict, in terms of war. So again, the, the, the Cossacks are all important for the Ukrainian early modern history. Building on that last question, I, I wanted to get into it and ask Professor Plahi, were there Cossacks that were specifically defined as military units as we know them the, there were special cossack formations in the polish army in the 17th century which basically had nothing to do with the cossacks per se but that was another term for light ca cavalry but uh, the Pure, the, the purely Cossack formations, either uh, in the Ukrainian army or in the Russian army later. This uh, uh, basically the people who are uh, combining in their uh, way of life, elements of military culture and, and uh, civic, civic culture. So basically they are someone who uh, part-time farmers and part-time warriors and uh, uh, that the, 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 the uh, Ukrainian Cossack state that I described to you was organized in a very interesting way so administrative structure was also at the same time a military structure so the in, in the US we have a state right somewhere in Europe we have a province uh, in Ukraine uh, territorial unit was called a regiment <laughs> and what that meant and it was run by a colonel so during the peaceful times okay they were engaged in in, in trade they engaged in the production of grain but the, the the military campaign comes along there is there is a conflict every village the responsibility is to produce a military unit which was called 100 there can be more people in that 100. It's like a company, right? So the, the, the captain, he runs the company during the military campaign, but it also runs it during during the, the uh, peacetime. So really the Cossacks are, and again, it, it doesn't depend whether, it, it, it doesn't matter whether Ukrainian or Russian, 
what army it is. It's the guys who actually can do both. They're not full-time warriors. They're not full-time farmers. Now, on this next question, I wanted to move it a little bit forward and instead talk about the world wars. I wanted to start with the Great War. If you take a look at the map of Europe going into World War I, what would have been called the Great War at the time, you can immediately recognize that the territory that is modern-day Ukraine falls on one of those fault lines, falls on one of those lines that is going to be fought back and forth, back and forth, back and forth throughout World War I and the Great War. So the question was really, how does the First World War impact the development of Ukraine? And I think you'll find Professor Plahi's answer fascinating. Well, uh, the war, in the Great War um, uh, in Europe uh, started uh, in, with us, Russia being, being uh, one major force in uh, Eastern and Central Europe and Austria, Hungary and Germany being another force. It's, if we are talking about the Eastern Front, that's, that's where the front line was going through Ukraine. Uh, it was going through Ukraine even before the start of the war because part of Ukraine was uh, part of Austria-Hungary and part was part of the Russian Empire. So whatever whatever war is 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 how it is imagined in, in and, and presented in today's films, in today's uh, works of history or works of fiction, it is never imagined in Ukrainian terms that that was actually the war in which one Ukrainian was fighting against other Ukrainians, right? So it's always, okay, Americans are all on the one side, French are all on the one side, Germans are all on the one side, Ukrainians are on the both sides, actually mobilized in the two armies and fighting each other. What the end of the war and actually collapse of the war in um, uh, empires, brings to the fore is a possibility for Ukrainians and for other groups that were divided. Poles were divided, for example. And that was their chance to create their own statehood, right, on the ruins of these empires that were destroyed as the result of the World War I. Russian Empire is going through a crisis. The Ottoman Empire falls apart. Austria-Hungary falls apart. So this is the chance for those who were divided, who were forced to fight the, the groups that are fighting each other to, to create a state of their own. And Ukraine tries to do that. The, the uh, Austrian part declares its own independent, the, independent, the Russian part declares its own independence. The, the problem is that the Ukrainians are not the only ones who are trying to do that. There are also other groups that are, that are, uh, mm, basically are better prepared maybe to fight that war. So when the dust settles after the end of World War II, or after the end of World War I, what you see is that Ukraine is now divided not between two states, but between four or five states. Russia reconstitu reconstitutes itself as the Soviet Union. Big part of Ukraine is part of Poland. Another part is part of Romania, and another part is part of Czechoslovakia. So the, the four countries are now divided in Ukrainian territories. And Ukrainians emerge as, during the interwar period, as the largest group in Europe that doesn't have its own statehood. So um, for uh, maybe um, listeners familiar with what is happening today in the Middle East, um, in Syria, Iran, Iraq. Think about the Kurds, the, the group that is divided between different, different states. So Ukrainians would be the Kurds of Europe uh, during the interwar period. Again, divided between different states and, and really being very, very hungry for their own statehood because they declared their statehood. They were fighting for it and they lost because the neighbors were, were more powerful. 
and Ukrainians didn't mobilize strong enough, or they were divided themselves. So the, the impact of the World War I on Ukraine is really creating of a nation that is more divided than before by the borders of other um, states and is more hungry for its own statehood than ever before. Now, obviously, between World War I and World War II, one of the most dramatic changes that we have, especially in Eastern Europe, is going to be the rise of Bolshevik Russia in 1917, which we covered in previous bonus episodes in the podcast. So in this next question, I wanted to talk more specifically about Professor Plahi about how do the inter- War years. So we're really talking about 1917 to 1940, 41 in this particular case. How do those impact the development of Ukraine, specifically focusing in this case on the industrial revolution and socialist industrialization, primarily led by Stalin? How do those ideas change what is the Ukraine? Uh, well, on the one hand, you have uh, the, the, the Bolsheviks in particular, and we are talking now about the Soviet Ukraine that ended up within the borders of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, on the one hand, well, they, they come with this uh, program of modernization of the society, right? So they're trying to... to um, uh, build industry. First of all, preparing to the war, so they're interested in the industry that can can produce tanks and, and weapons and guns and so on and so forth. Uh, that comes with the uh, idea of education, right? You, you need to educate people, you, you need to educate future soldiers. Uh, that comes with a major transformation of the uh, people from the villages moving into the cities. And the idea that all of that has to be accomplished within a very short period of time. On the, on the one hand, you see this wonderful things like the, the um, educational system that is being built and people learn to, to, to read and write for the first time. You see the, the, the process of urbanization that the state makes. But it is done by ideologically motivated authoritarian regime that believes that actually it's, it's for its survival, it can sacrifice millions and millions of people. And that's, that's where Ukraine really finds itself right at the center of that. On the one hand, there is this forced industrialization that is taking place there, building, building industry, the, the most metallurgical industry at that time in Ukraine, which Ukraine was rich in coal and, and iron ore. On the other hand, there is a forced collectivization. So you need money to, to build all those factories. Where do you get this money? You can't go to the uh, Britain and, and to the United States and say, give us the money to build a communist revolution. Uh, the answer that you would get was, well, we are not really crazy about communist revolution. <laughs> and second, by the way, you never paid the debt that the Tsarist government owes us. So basically, the, 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 the credit score was really very low. So what the regime does, it actually goes to the village and takes uh, resources there by force. Uh, through the collectivization, that's the way how to get control over the over the grain, and uh, uh, Ukraine becomes one of the main victims of the um, the grain requisition campaign in the Soviet Union in 1932-1933. The reason for that, there were multiple reasons. One of them was that Ukraine already acquired by that time the the name of the breadbasket of Europe. All those steps that I was discussing about, uh, talking about, and the Cossacks that were moving there, they turned all of that by the beginning of the 20th century into the, into the grain fields, turning the steppe areas into, into the grain basket. And that's, that's where the, the Soviet regime was, was trying to get their money, to take this grain, to feed the cities, to ship it abroad, 
to sell it for hard currency and then bring the American technology to build to build all those all those um, uh, hydroelectric power stations and factories that would build uh, cars and would build uh, would build um, uh, the, the tanks for the for the war effort and so on and so forth. So uh, in Ukraine, what you see also, because the, there is a resistance happening to what is happening, there is a major, at the time of the Ukrainian famine, which is called as Holodomor, four million, up to four million of Ukrainians die. The, the, the numbers are still debated and discussed up to 10 millions, but four millions, that's what the, the uh, demographers agree on. And it comes together with a major assault on the uh, Ukrainian uh, culture and uh, on the on the Ukrainian uh, also political elite and cadres. So Rafael Lemkin, the, the uh, lawyer who created the, the term uh, genocide, believed that developments in Ukraine actually um, qualified or, or, or corresponded to that term in terms of the assault on, on the peasantry, with the famine, assault on the culture, and assault on the political elite. So um, the, the outcome of that was really, as I write in my book, a very different Ukraine. In Ukraine, uh, mm, mm, at, the, at, the, at least every 10th Ukrainian died in the famine of 1932-1933, at least. And you can imagine what impact that has on those who actually survived. So the, the resistance to the Soviet regime was really broken, in particular the peasant resistance to the re regime. The peasantry was as such as a group, as a social group, destroyed through the process of collectivization. So the, the farmers actually disappeared. The, 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 the agriculture was collectivized. And uh, um, the, the, uh, those who survived certainly learned the lesson. The only way to survive is actually to do what the government wants you to do, to join the collective farm. Our next topic of discussion, I think, is one of the most insightful because I really wanted to get into the impact of World War II on Ukraine. To understand that, though, I think you have to understand the way in which the German occupation in 1917, 1918 was so dramatically different compared to the German occupation in 1941, 42, 43, tail end of 1944, before the Red Army sweeps through. The two types of Germans and German officers, I suppose specifically, in charge during those time periods are totally different. And how that will impact the Ukraine going forward is so crucial to understanding and also understanding the interchange between how Ukraine and Ukrainians experienced Soviet and Bolshevik Russia going into World War II, but then also bore the brunt of the Nazi occupation is critical. Here's Professor Pla, he had to say. Sure, sure. Well, um, uh, as you can imagine, after going through the, through the famine and, and uh, great, Stalin's great terror, uh, mm, quite few, the, I, I, I can't, I can't give the number, but a significant number of Ukrainians certainly believe that it couldn't be worse than that. So there were, were crowds welcoming the, the German advance into Ukraine. Uh, the, the belief was that the Germans whom they see in 1941 are more or less the Germans that they saw back uh, during World War I in 1918. And they couldn't be more wrong. If the, the Germans of 1918 were the Germans fighting the war and were interested in, in uh, um, uh, basically even state building in the region, creating states they're supporting, for example, Ukrainian state building efforts. The thinking, the German thinking at that time was actually strategic. 
Uh, as long as it is not Russia, it's good because it weakens Russia. So let's have separate Polish state, let's have separate Ukrainian state, and so on and so forth. The Germans of 1941 are, of course, Nazis. And uh, the, 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 their vision is racist. So what they are now, why they showed up in the region is actually to build their, uh, their colonial empire there. Uh, they, they lost colonies in Africa after World War I, so they decided we'll now turn Eastern Europe into, into our colonies. And uh, uh, more than that, we'll just create a, a Lebensraum, a living space for the German farmers, basically, either killing or chasing away population out of, out of the region. Uh, so it didn't take too long for, for anyone who had high expectations for the Germans showing up in the region to, of course, change change their mind about that. And that, that is certainly true either for public, general public, or for the political, political uh, parties, groups, and organizations, including Ukrainian nationalists who originally allied themselves with Nazi Germany in the hope of fighting against the communist regime in, in Ukraine. By the end of 1941, they are actually at war, also clandestine war with both Nazis and communists at that time. And uh, Ukraine is also mm, one of the major, major killing fields of the Holocaust, right? And uh, it's, it's also, you, you, you said that uh, the, the German occupation of Ukraine in 1941 and 1918 are two different things. The German occupation of France and Ukraine in 1941 are two very different things. Because again, the, the Ukrainians, like Slavs in general, are treated, treated as untermenschen, so not fully human. So according to the ra racial system, so uh, the racist, racist, racist beliefs of, of the Nazi leadership. And uh, uh, the, the treatment of the Jews also is very different. Uh, again, the, the, the goal is the same, to annihilate the, the Jewish population. But if the Jews of France are being actually rounded up, or of Germany rounded up and sent during night when no one can see to the uh, um, extermination camps, mostly located in Eastern Europe on the territory of Poland. The Jews of Ukraine or Belarus or Russia for that matter are just killed right there in, in their, uh, um, on, on the outskirts of the villages or, or, or towns where they live, in the plain sight of the population at large. So you now think about the, the population at large who survived the death of every 10th member of that group in 1934 and now witnessing, or sometimes as the local police participating in those acts of genocide because they're mobilized by the, by the Holocaust now, by the, by the German authorities. So it's, 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 it's uh, um, uh, basically development that, that has its impact not just on the Jewish community, the, the Jews who are survived, and some of them are, are saved by the local population, Ukrainians in particular, but also on the population at large. So this is, this is the kind of World War II that you really don't... Uh, don't read about in the books on war in Europe or World War II in Europe uh, to a degree that they're focused on uh, either France or they're uh, focused on Germany or they're focused even on Czechoslovakia. So it's, 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 it's a different story in terms of the uh, level of atrocities. Uh, either, either we are talking about the, the um, the, the majority population in the region, or the minorities like the Jews, or, or for example, the Roma, another group that went through the actually was became the victim of the uh, of the uh, mass extermination. Professor Plahi has a lot of great chapters on the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, which then leads to the establishment of Ukraine as an independent country, or maybe that's a chicken and an egg scenario. Maybe Ukraine pulls away and that causes the final collapse of the Soviet Union. 
But what I wanted to get into in this final topic is today. Today, the media focuses, especially in the United States, a lot on the annexation of the Crimea as part of the cause of the conflict that has led to so many contemporary problems, including also um, the first impeachment of former President Donald Trump. But I think that's an oversimplified version. And Professor Plahi and I, in this last section, talk about all the different ways in which uh, the Russian Federation and modern-day Russia has sought to uh, impress its will upon Ukraine, how that's potentially such a devastating impact for Western democracies. You think about Poland, France, Germany, Italy. Ukraine is really the first line of defense against totalitarian and authoritarian issues coming in from Russia. And so what I asked him to do is explain briefly the context of that conflict and how that conflict is influencing the world today still. Uh, well, the, the, the conflict really started with the outright annexation of the Crimea in uh, March of, uh, 20, uh, of 2014. Uh, and uh, Russia delivered uh, ultimatum to Ukraine um, through the foreign ministry that uh, what they want next was actually the so-called federalization of Ukraine, which means that uh, each region uh, would acquire a veto power over foreign policy decisions. So um, uh, imagine U.S. state, one state disagrees with what the, 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 the rest of the states want in terms of the uh, foreign policy, uh, foreign policy or the, the economic agreements or, or military agreements or any other agreements. So basically the goal was to make Ukraine ungovernable and uh, uh, in, the, in that sense actually take over the entire Ukraine. And once uh, Ukraine refused to do that, then stage two started, and that's something that is became known as a hybrid warfare or war in eastern Ukraine. So uh, it started with the infiltration of the Russian uh, commander groups uh, uh, in, now from Russia and from the Crimea. Uh, the major information attack on, on the region uh, and uh, eventually sending the uh, Russian army into the battle, at least on two occasions, uh, in August of 2014 and then in early 2015, now fighting the Ukrainian army that was trying to take over the region, to re return the control over the region. Uh, in uh, 2014, the, the line, the, the so-called demarcation line was established. And at that time, the, the concern of many people uh, in, the, in, in, in the United States, in Europe, those who were following the events, those who were influencing the events, was that the, Don, the, the eastern part of Ukraine, the so-called Donbass area, can become a frozen conflict, like the frozen conflict in Moldova and a number of other former post-Soviet republics. The problem is today that it never got to the frozen stage. It is a conflict that never got frozen. So the, the, the um, ceasefire never lasted for too long. People continue to um, die even today. The, the uh, uh, artillery shelling continues from both sides. And uh, uh, this is only part, one part of the ongoing this hybrid warfare. Because other part of it is, of course, the um, cyber attacks on the Soviet, on, on the Ukrainian um, um, energy system, uh, the um, um, interference in, in the Ukrainian elections, the um, attacks by the so-called bots and, uh, and the, the uh, propaganda uh, campaign and efforts in Ukraine. 
So all of these things that I am talking about, uh, they sound familiar now to the American public because first they were tried in Ukraine in 2014, 2015, before all of that was brought to the United States. And uh, uh, the Ukrainians already in 2014, 2015 had to uh, create a special TV program which was called Stop Fake. So the fake news <laughs> were there already much earlier on. So the a special program was there to analyze what is true and what is not true in this, in this uh, now information space that got invaded by Russia and manipulated by Russia. So that is, that is uh, the, the, the um, reality in which Ukraine lives now since 2014. And uh, it's also the, the reminder that the war in Ukraine or the war on Ukraine, it's not just war on Ukraine itself, because Ukraine is perceived as basically a, 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 the, 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 the front line between, between Russia and the West in terms of the West, of course, the, the leading force of the West is the United States of America. Uh, Ukraine is one of very few states on the post -Soviet, uh, um, in, in the post-Soviet space which actually uh, remains to be democratic. So Russia is not, Belarus is not. So the, the, most of the states in the post in the post-Soviet um, area are autocratic to one to one degree or another. So Ukraine is is the, a democratic state, and this is this is a threat to the um, to the autocratic regimes in general, whatever Ukraine does or doesn't do, because it sends, uh, in the opinion of the autocrats in the region, a wrong signal to their own population. That if Ukrainians who lived in the Soviet Union for so long, like you guys did, like Russians or Belarusians, can be democratic, means that Russia or Belarus theoretically can be democratic as well. So again, this is this is not the example that that uh, let's say Vladimir Putin wants wants to be there or to or for democratic society to be successful, right? Um, uh, and uh, the, 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 again, the, the, that war goes on. It is a hybrid war, really, and it goes on many, many levels. And there is a lot at, at stake in, in that war that goes beyond just uh, Russian-Ukrainian relations. Finally, if you know me, you know I cannot avoid a little bit of speculative history. So I asked Professor Plahi to speculate. Which is actually what he did in the first version of the book. So what is going to happen... 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Is Ukraine going to be able to resist Russian efforts to encroach upon its sovereignty in a variety of ways? Or will Ukraine fall more and more under the orbit of a resurgent Russia trying to rebuild the Soviet Union? And what in the West can we potentially do to offset those efforts? Well, uh, whatever Ukrainian successes you have today, and in this last chapter of the book, actually, uh, really uh, do a, 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 almost a list again. It's not a list. It's I, I discussed that, and it's 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 um, hopefully even again it, it adds uh, to 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 the understanding of Ukrainian history and Ukraine today. But I discussed those reforms that were undertaken already in the conditions of the war after 2014, and they're, they're quite impressive. Ukraine still has a long, long way to go, but uh, the, the last five to six years showed that you can actually be successful in defending your, your sovereignty and transforming your, your economic system and political system. Now, whatever successes are there, they're the result of the efforts of two main groups. One group is the Ukrainian society, Another group are the Western backers of Ukraine because they created really a common front 
really against the vested interests in Ukraine that are represented by big business. Uh, big business like, like the Ukrainian society in general is, of course, fighting war with Russia. But where the differences between the big business and the Ukrainian society is actually about the transformation of the economic system. Uh, getting rid of, of the monopolies, uh, getting rid of the corruption, and so on and so forth. And that battle, so Ukraine fights these two battles. And in one battle against Russia, it's the society and the establishment uh, uh, together. In the war on the on the uh, corruption, uh, it's the Ukrainian society against against the, the vested interests. And um, uh, the the uh, in this both wars again very much uh, depends on the position of the of the United States and Western countries. If uh, Ukraine as a whole and the, the civil society will not be abandoned, the 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 successes, the, the, the chances for success are much, 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 much higher. Because uh, if you look look at the threat that Ukraine deals with, uh, threats coming from Russia, Ukraine can't deal with that on its own just for, for, for a longer period of time. Um, and uh, that uh, th th that means that uh, again, uh, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, and success in Ukraine depends on the solidarity. Uh, but if the war is won and, and war on, on 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 this disinformation, war on the aggression, uh, it will be a victory not just for Ukraine. Uh, uh, to to um, stress the importance of Ukraine of the region, I, I just want to um, make one one point, and that point is that Ukraine is the second largest post-Soviet space. Once Ukraine decided to leave the Soviet Union in December of 1991, the USSR was dissolved within one week because Russia lost interest in the Soviet Union without the second largest component and part of that. And now Russia fights a war in Ukraine, taking huge losses in terms of prestige, economic relations with the West and so on and so forth, for one simple reason, realization that if the second largest post-Soviet space is not part of the Russia's project of reintegration the space, that project is doomed. So where Ukraine goes, really, on that depends also the, the future of the post-Soviet space. And if Russia is able to actually reconstitute its control of the post-Soviet space, we can, we can see um, some, certainly much more aggressive Russia in the future. Well, again, I want to thank Professor Plahi for the interview. Um, this has been actually one of the most informative interviews I think I've ever done. It's a subject that I don't know anything about. And I came away from it knowing a lot more, not only about Ukrainian history, but about how Ukrainian history fits into the world today and why things are the way they are, which for those of us who love history, I think that's really what we want to know. How do we get here? And how can we potentially change where we're going? For anyone who's interested in the book, I've got the link in the show notes to check it out. It's fascinating. It's 400 plus pages long. It's well-researched. It's akin to a lot of, um, if you think about maybe little Tom Holland work, Adrian Goldsworthy work. It's it covers a long period of time, but it never gets plotting. It it always keeps up that narrative that makes it a little bit easier for a lot of people who don't have the background to understand. And certainly I grew up, I was taught European history is England, France, Italy, you know, Germany later on, Spain in the age of exploration. That's about it. This explains to me why that's wrong. And why maybe I, in particular, need to go back and do a better job of bringing us up to date 
on some of Eastern Europe and why Eastern Europe matters so much, especially today. Great book. Check it out if you're interested. Love the interview. Love speaking with him. Hope you enjoy it too.